Hey everybody, welcome back. I am so glad you had an opportunity to come by. Um, this is the HTO channel. If you have not been here before, I welcome you and I thank you for dropping in. So with that said, let's just go ahead and get started today. Uh, this is a an interactive video, so I would suggest that if you can, uh, that you could use this along with your actual physical Bible or your digital Bible. Also, just use this video. You can use it in various ways. You can use it to um, go along with your family and your friends, study the Bible, study his word with your family and friends or alone, however you see fit uh, to do this. But you will get your best reward from it if you are using your Bible, your journal, whatever tools that you'll actually use to study his word. So today, let's just jump straight in. We are going to look at the question, what's up with sin? You know, what's up with sin? Um, you know, we hear it so much, but do we really have a good understanding of what that means and how it has an impact on our lives? So I want you to remember one thing as you go through this video. One thing, his shirt says it all. Jesus truly is king. So no matter whatever circumstances we are facing, if we were reminded of that one fact that Jesus truly he truly is king and so before we get started we're going to do an exercise where we are just able to look at the word we're not only able to slow down and breathe and take that deep ruah breath in god that we could do it and combine that with the practice of looking at his word so it's what i call spiritually focused breathing so we're going to focus on, on hebrews chapter two, verse one. So take a listen to this. That is why we ought to pay even closer attention to the voice that has been speaking so that we will never drift away from it. So you'll have me, I'll give you a count and you'll breathe deeply through your nostrils on the inhale and you will exhale as well through your nostrils. So on the count of three, a deep breath nice and slow through your nostrils one two three inhale exhale for seven that is why we ought to pay even closer attention to the voice that has been speaking so that we will never drift away from it Inhale for three. Exhale slowly for seven. That is why we ought to pay even closer attention to the voice that has been speaking so that we will never drift away from it. Inhale for three. Exhale through your nostrils for seven. Last time, I'll int intentionally read it slow. That is why we ought to pay even closer attention to the voice that has been speaking so that we will never drift away from it. So inhale one deep last time through your nostrils Slowly on the exhale for seven. So it's just a good practice before we start our Bible study. Um, we just have to prepare. You know, a lot of times we have a lot of stuff going on. So it's just a way of just easing our mind, taking that breath, settling down, clearing our mind, clearing our thoughts. So with that said, we're going to pray. Um, and our prayer today is based on that's part of that same scripture, Hebrews chapter two, verses one through four. That is why we ought to pray even, pay even closer attention to the voice that has been speaking so that we will never drift away from it. For if the words of instruction and inspiration brought by heaven's messengers were valid 
And if we live in a universe where sin and disobedience receive their just rewards, then how will we escape destruction if we ignore this great salvation? We heard it from our Lord Jesus, then from those who passed on his teaching. God also testifies to this truth by signs and wonders and miracles and the gifts of the Holy Spirit lighting on those he chooses. So if you're alone or if you're with a group, let's join together in prayer. And you can just relax as we pray and just take in this uh, nice, beautiful nature scene as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for you are the great God. We pray in the name of Jesus, God, that we will pay attention to your words as the writer in Hebrews has stated, that we pay attention, God, so that we do not drift away. Father, I pray for those under the sound of my voice, that wherever those struggles are, are, are within their lives, God, that you come alongside each of us and help us continue. We thank you for helping us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, God, that you illuminate the word for us so that when we pay attention, we not only pay attention, but slowly but surely, day by day, your word becomes a reality in our lives. God, teach us from your word today about sin and all of us who struggle in different areas. God, we thank you for your grace. Hmm, God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. And God, we thank you for your strength. Have your way in, for, and through us. Bless the listeners. Bless the listeners, God. We thank you for it now in Christ's name. Amen. So we started out the presentation asking what's up with sin. Well, let's see what's up with grace. You know, even through all of this, you'll see by the end of this that grace, mercy, and God's strength is what will carry us. So this is from the voice translation. You can find this on Bible Gateway and you can find a hard copy and a Kindle copy with Amazon. Grace is no license to sin. As creatures, we are made to serve our creator in the absence of truth. We will serve somebody or something. It's an essential part of our nature. Our only choice is this. Whom will we serve? At one time, we all served sin and grew weak under its deadly power over us. Now through God's grace, we have become servants of obedience that sets us right with God, each other, and ourselves. We must daily decide whose servant we are and offer him our hands, our feet, our hearts, our eyes. That's what's up with grace. So as we continue on and just preparing ourselves for this uh, study of his word, we are going to enter into worship. And again, uh, we are reminded that biblical worship is not talent. Biblical worship is a person whose heart is bent. Their lean is towards God. Biblical worship sings to an audience of one. Biblical worship seeks not to please man, but to please the father. Biblical worship is a tool that we use to commune with the father. So with that said, we're going to be reminded of a song um, that's performed by Todd Delaney and others called the anthem. And if you look at those lyrics, it says, hallelujah, you have won the victory. Hallelujah. You have won it all for me. And so if you haven't heard it, you can just find it on Google, on uh, Spotify. Um, just take a listen to it on YouTube. And, you know, it's just real sweet when you sing it. Hallelujah. 
You have won the victory. Hallelujah. You have won it all for me. Death could not hold you down. Listen to those lyrics. You are the risen King, seated in majesty. Listen to this. You are the risen King, by his stripes. We are healed by his nail pierced hands. We're free by his blood. We're washed clean. Sing that part. Now we have the victory. And it's just slowed down a little bit. Listen to this part. The power of sin is broken. Jesus overcame it all. He has won our freedom. Jesus has won it all. So you can continue in your own uh, power. Um, it's interactive. If you, you want to stop, look up the video, or if you want to just continue, we're just preparing our hearts and mind to receive his word, the engrafted word sown deep within us, a seed that will produce and multiply. So with that said, there is a small error here. Uh, it is not Romans five. It is Romans chapter seven. So Romans chapter seven, the first six verses, Paul uses an illustration for marriage. And then verses seven through 13, he talks about sin's use of the law. And then 14 through 25, he talks about the problem of sin in us. So I think we're ready. Hopefully your heart and mind is prepared and let's grab our Bibles, grab our Bible app or whatever we have and your favorite highlighters. You know, sometimes I even like to, when I have more time with Bible journaling, you know, stickers and all that other stuff can be fun um, as well. So we're ready. And again, I will be reading from, uh, I believe this is the voice translation. It may be the passion translation. I'm sorry if I made a mistake here, but let's just go ahead and jump right in. And it says, my brothers and sisters who are well-versed in the law, don't you realize that a person is subject to the law only as long as he is alive? So for example, a wife is obligated by the law to her husband until his death. If the husband dies, she is freed from the parts of the law that relate to her marriage. If she is sleeping with another man while her husband is alive, she is rightly labeled an, adul an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law and can marry another man. In such a case, she is not an adulteress. So we just pause for, for a moment. Again, Paul is using the analogy of marriage and adultery, and he's going to draw some similarities between us or, or he's speaking to this Jewish audience on the law and then our freedom from the law because through Christ, the law, the law, not it's not the law itself, but how we serve the law has died. So let's continue. My brothers and sisters, in the same way you have died when it comes to the law because of your connection with the body of the anointed one. That's what I highlighted. If you'll highlight that in your uh, Bible as well, his death and your death with him frees you to belong to the one who has was raised from the dead. So we can bear fruit for God. As we were living in the flesh, the law could not solve the problem of sin. It only awakened our lust. 
for more and cultivated the fruit of death in our bodily members. But now that we have died to those chains that imprisoned us, we have been released from the law to serve in a new spirit empowered life, not the old written code. So let's take this in again. Remember the analogy of a woman who's married to another that through death, if her spouse were to die, she would be free to marry another person. If she married another person that uh, while her spouse was alive, she would be considered an adulteress. So Paul is saying, just like in the same way that that woman's husband has died, we have died. We have died when it comes to the law or our relationship with it, our relationship with it, because we have a new relationship. Look at that first highlight with the body of the anointed one. So remember, have freedom here to highlight whatever you'd like to highlight. I'm just highlighting. You can highlight what I've highlighted, but then go back and, and, and add notes and do whatever you need to do. So if you look at that same verse, notice why he says it. He says, why? So we can bear fruit for God. This is the reason why we are freed and we are now joined, married to the anointed one, Jesus Christ. And the purpose of that is so that we can bear fruit for God. But now Paul goes on to this discussion. If you look at verse five, highlight awakened our lust. So his discussion is that the law could not solve the problem of sin. But in reality, what it did was, Paul is saying that it's awakened our lust. You know, it's kind of like when you tell, you tell your children, you know, they're not thinking about the wrong, but the minute you tell them, hey, don't touch that, they actually want to touch it even more. And so that's kind of what Paul is saying, is that once the law, um, we, were, we were made aware of the law, that it awakened a desire within us right? Because now we know through the, the mistake of Eve, the sin of Eve, that now we have the knowledge of good and evil. So I also have in verse six, died to those chains that imprisoned us and we serve in a new spirit empowered life. So that's the thing we have to remember through this entire study of Romans chapter seven. Yeah, we're going to talk about sin, but Paul is reminding us that we have died to those things that have, have imprisoned us because we were baptized into his death and raised in his resurrection. So now we have the ability to serve, not in the way that by the Jewish customs and traditions, but we serve in a new spirit empowered life. Okay. So again, it's always good to stop and think. So we're going to take a sila here and I'm going to ask you some questions. What do you think? He, he said something about, we don't serve the written code. What do you think Paul means by that? And why do you think Paul used the analogy of marriage? You know, out of all the things that he could have used, why did he use the analogy of marriage? Just Pause and, and think about that. And again, if you want to pause the video, you, you're welcome to do that. So verse seven. So what is the story? Is the law itself sin? Absolutely not. It is the exact opposite. I would never have known what sin is if it were not for the law. For example, I would not have known that desiring something that brings belongs to my neighbor is sin if the law had not said you are not to covet. Sin took advantage of the commandment to create a constant stream of greed and desire within me. I began to want everything. You see, apart from the law, sin lies dormant. So let's, let's go back, process this. So verse seven, he's, I absolutely, uh, I actually highlighted his answer. Absolutely not. And that's the same. That's true today. The law is not sin itself. You know, when the father laid out those commandments and some of the other uh, requirements in the old Testament, the law and the standard standards itself are not sin. 
Paul is saying that the law is not sin, you know, it, it's the exact opposite. And, or in other words, how would I know that I shouldn't covet unless I read a law or read the last commandment that says you are not to covet. So then he's going on to say that, and I highlighted in verse eight, you see apart from the law, sin lies dormant. So in other words, again, how would I know I can't sin when I don't even know the standard of God? So, you know, again, that's, that's his mindset and the point that he's making. Now we know it's different now because the, 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 the spirit of the law is written within us now. Um, but let's continue with verses nine through 12. And by the way, this is the voice translation. There was a time when I was living without the law, but the commandment came and changed everything. Thing. Sin came to life and I died. This commandment was supposed to bring life, but in my experience, it brought death. Verse 11, sin took advantage of the commandment, tricked me and exploited it in order to kill me. So hear me out. The law is holy and its commandments are holy, right, and good. So um, in reading commentaries, uh, one commentary, uh, one ex, uh, explanation they gave for verse nine was, this is like the age of accountability that Paul is referencing. Or in other words, that, you know, there was a time when I didn't know about the law. You know, I, I wasn't old enough. I, I had no clue. I didn't know anything about thou shall not lie, thou shall not steal, thou shall not kill, thou shall not covet. But the minute that I learned about it, right? The, the minute you, it's kind of like he's saying, the minute we're told what not to do, all of a sudden we have a choice. And so he's saying that sin is now, that sin represents that opportunity because now I can covet before I didn't even know that I wasn't supposed to covet. Okay. So then in verse 11, I highlighted sin took advantage of the commandment, tricked me and exploited it in order to kill me. We all know that sin leads to death. That's why it's called the law of sin and death. The law itself is not sin. It's the law of sin and death. So then he nails this. He emphasizes this for us in verse 12. Hear me out. The law is holy. The commandments are holy. They're right and they're good. And so it gives us good balance in, in the times that we live in. You know, we kind of think we can't have a, a imbalanced viewpoint or a POV point of view of grace. You know, that grace is not this greasy grace that gives us a license to do whatever we want to do. So this note is from the Life Application New Testament commentary. And it says the law restrains us and teaches us God's will, but it also reveals and stimulates our sinful nature. That's the best way to sum up what Paul was saying there. So again, we pause for a moment and we just think over, you know, what we've taken in. We started talking about marriage and the analogy with marriage and Paul is talking about now uh, how the law and ha has come forth and sin is stimulated within us. So here are some questions to think about. According to Paul, this is a recall question, is the law sin? Based on what you just read, is the law sin? In your opinion, do you think that mankind needs a law? You know, after Eve sinned in the garden, in your opinion, do you think that we need spiritual laws, even natural laws. Do we need spiritual laws? Do we need natural laws? For instance, let's put this in the natural. Um, let's say we didn't have stoplights. Do you believe that everyone would exercise caution at an intersection? Or do we need something that says red, then yellow, then green? Something to think about. Verse 11. According to Paul, what will sin do? Another recall question. And then in verse 12, how does the apostle Paul describe the law? If you need to look back by pausing the video, um, go ahead and do that. Again, how does the apostle Paul describe the law? 
Verse 13, so did the good law bring about my death? Look at that, where he says the good law. I like that. That's something that we probably could uh, actually highlight again, the good law. That would help us to really remember what he's saying here, the good law. Okay, let's continue. Absolutely not. It was sin that killed me, not the law. It's the nature of sin to produce death through what is good and exploit the commandments to multiply sins, catch this word, vile effects. This is what we know. The law comes from the spiritual realm. My problem is that I am of the fallen human realm owned by sin, which tries to keep me in its service. Listen, I can't explain my actions. Here's why. I'm not able to do the things I want. And at the same time, I do the things I despise. So man, that's a lot in there. So I highlighted verse 13. You'll highlight with me nature of sin. This is the nature of sin to produce death. I could stop right there through how does it do it through what is good and it exploits the commandments to multiply sins vile effect it's almost like sin is like this monster of its own and its one goal is to produce death in all of us and one thing i want to be mindful of is death comes in a lot of ways it could be physical death you know all we have to do is turn on the news at any given point and you can see these people, I won't mention name, you know, they're at the height of their career, but because of sin, you know, something come, happens, FBI rolls up on them. And the next thing you know, everything has crashed in their money, their relationships, everything. That's a, a, an, a, another type of death, a loss of wealth, a loss of family, a loss of relationship. That's the main goal of sin. That's why we started with that first scripture. Let's pay attention to his words so that we ourselves don't drift away. And so, okay, then I highlighted, this is what we know. The law comes from the spiritual realm. And we know that, you know, it was God who gave Moses the 10 commandments and all the requirements and Deuteronomy and Leviticus and all of that. It came from the spiritual realm. And so Paul goes on to say, you know, but I got a problem. I'm from the human realm. And so what I like here is Paul is doing what, you know, I believe that we should all do there. You, we have to be honest, you know, growing up, my mother would say, honey, the biggest lie you can tell is the one you tell yourself, right? And so it's just being honest and uh, about our struggles, about our difficulties, because we even see here with Apostle Paul, I mean, he wrote almost two thirds of the New Testament and he's he's reflecting on himself and saying, you know, there there's a struggle. You know, I want to do what's right, but then there's this thing called sin within me and I do the things that I despise. So just keep that in mind. So here's the point continuing. God still desires our moral obedience, but we are to serve Christ by focusing on his desires, not on a list of commands. We have been released so that we can serve in the new way by the spirit living within us guiding us and showing us how to please God. So we don't have to, in other words, we don't have to sit down and try to remember all of this stuff. You know, his, the law, it's been written on our heart. It's been written on our conscience. And so remember uh, Christ, when he says, I did not come to abolish the law, but I've come to fulfill it. So two things that we need to remember, we don't serve uh, through traditions and customs of the law because we're working for salvation. And at the same time, when we fall short, Christ has already, already paid the penalty for it. So we have been released so that we can serve now in a new way that we, we live and we seek to please the father. 
And so we are still called to serve, but our master is gracious and we are no longer trapped by the cycle of effort, failure, and guilt. Now let's talk about Paul for a minute. We just got through talking about his struggles, you know, what, what he, his self-reflection, um, just, we get to hear what his heart was saying at that time. It has been suggested that Paul simply is being very open about his own ongoing struggles with sin, but this view is often taken as an excuse to justify some Christians repeated failures in their battles with sin and temptation. Certainly, Paul did face spiritual struggles and failures. However, in light of what he has already stated about dying of sin and about the power of Christ gives that the power of Christ gives us over our sinful nature, it is unlikely that Paul had a consistent habit of giving in to sin. In addition, phrases such as sold under sin, I know that in me dwells no good thing and oh wretched man that I am, do not seem to describe the Christian experience as Paul conveys it throughout this letter. It is more likely that he is speaking from his personal experience before he encountered Christ. Up to that time, he was depending on strict obedience to God's law in order to be righteous and to find favor with God. So let's continue with verse 16. If I'm doing the things I've already decided not to do, I'm agreeing with the law regarding what is good. But now I am no longer the one acting. I've lost control. Sin has taken up residence in me and is wreaking havoc. I know that in me, that is, in my fallen human nature, there is nothing good. I can will myself to do something good, but that does not help me carry it out. I can determine that I'm going to do good, but I don't do it. Instead, I end up living out the evil that I decided not to do. If I end up doing the exact thing I pledged not to do, I am no longer doing it because sin has taken up residence in me. So here I highlight it. Sin has taken up residence in me and is wreaking havoc. You know, even though he wrote this thousands of years ago, that's still true for us today. That if we, what's true is that if we allow sin to run our lives, if we allow, even though, get this, even though, like we we uh, worshipped earlier, the power of sin is broken, right? It's broken, but if we cooperate and we don't allow that power to be evident in our lives, it will wreak havoc. There's no getting around that. And so Paul is saying that, hey, there's this struggle There are some things that I want to do and that I biblically know to do and that I know God wants me to do, but I have this sin in me that has taken up residence and, and, and I'm trying my best. I'm trying my best, but I'm struggling, right? I mean, I didn't get any more, any more raw than that. He is just being real. And I think we would benefit even if there are those specific areas that we're just honest with God and we say, Hey, I'm, I'm struggling. God, could you give, could you remind me? Cause we don't have to ask God for what he's already done. A lot of times we just need to remind ourselves, God, remind me of the power of your Holy spirit, that he is here dwelling on the inside of me to help me with specific areas where I struggle. And believe me, I would just venture to say, I don't know of anybody on the face of this earth that doesn't have a struggle. 
You know, if they do, then, hey, excuse me for being my mother would say, well, honey, beg my pardon. But as far as I know, there is no one that I know that doesn't have areas, doesn't have struggles, doesn't have sin. And so that if we are honest and we seek the help spiritually and physically and community, you know, we can weaken through what God has already done, right? He's done the finished works. We just have to cooperate with the works that have already been done. So let's just continue on and see here uh, uh, our apostle Paul. We're gonna think this through again. So here are some questions for you. And again, you can journal this, you can think of this mentally, Um, just, chew on it, discuss it. If you're in a group right now, sitting in your living room, pause it and go around the room and see what everybody, what their opinion is and what they think. So what one question is, according to Paul, what will the nature of sin produce? Let's just see if we um, remember what what he said in the scripture. And then how many realms does Paul mention? And which realm does the law come from? Recall question. Uh, What conflict did Paul have? And then do you believe that sin can cause havoc in a person's life? Do you think that we sin and we just kind of get off and that that, you know, seed doesn't come up? There was something that the Holy Spirit taught taught me um, a while ago, and I always remember, and he says, you know what? You sow to your own garden. It's the seeds that we put in our own garden. We don't get to reap from anybody else's garden. It's the seeds. It's it's the seeds that we plant in our own soil that we reap from. We don't reap from anybody else's garden. We reap from our own. So the question is, well, what, what seeds am I putting in my own garden? Are they filled with sin? Because if it's sin, it's going to come up no matter how much God loves me. Now he has the right because he's sovereign, right? for mercy to keep that sin from coming up and, and, and doing so having some consequences in my life that I don't want. Right. That's why when he says in first John one and nine, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all right unrighteousness. So what he's saying here is a lot of people think, well, you know, he already died on the cross. And so why do I have to confess my sin? You're not really confessing it for him. You're confessing it for yourself. You're confessing to weaken the, the sin's power that it has you know, on you or on me. That's what the confession, the confession is a way of saying, God, I'm sorry, because I know this is not your standard. So we're not confessing because we don't believe that his blood covered us. We're confessing for our own benefit and also for children to be children of God, to say, you know, I I apologize because I know this is not pleasing to you, God, God, when I sin in this area. That's all. That's what we're doing. You know, they said we don't have to make it that deep. It's not that deep. All right. 21. Here's an important principle I've discovered. Paul's continued. Regardless of my desire to do the right thing, it is clear that evil is never far away. For deep down, I am in happy agreement with God's law. But the rest of me does not concur or agree. I see a very different principle at work in my bodily members, and it is at war with my mind. I have become a prisoner in this war to the rule of sin in my body. <laughs> right? I mean, he, he's just laying it out. And so, you know, I think about, my goodness, Paul, I know if you're struggling, what about us? You know, he didn't even have the internet. He didn't have access to the sin like we do in our day. But I mean, you know, drugs and uh, uh, liquor stores on every corner. So, I mean, if it was rough for him, my goodness, I know hopefully he's looking down at heaven at us and saying, man, I feel for y'all. I feel for you guys. But anyway, so let's look at the highlight. Highlight in your Bible that evil is never far away. I mean, you can sit in your house as a monk. It doesn't matter. Evil will fight because the evil is within us. And unfortunately, through no fault, you know, we were children. Remember what we read in the other uh, books of Roman. We were children of the first Adam. The first Adam. And so it's not far away. I mean, think about Cain and Abel. 
Nobody taught Cain how to murder his brother, right? That had to be within him somewhere. And then he had the audacity to try to cover it up. <laughs> Excuse me. And then cover it up with who? Cover it up with, um, with God. Let me start that all over again. So here's an important principle I've discovered. Regardless of my desires to do the right thing, it is clear that evil is never far away. For deep down, I am happy in a happy agreement with God's law, but the rest of me needs does not concur. I see a very different principle at work in my bodily members, and it is at war with my mind. I have become a prisoner in this war to, to the rule of sin in my body. So Paul is saying here that evil is never far away. You know, we um, it's just a reminder that we didn't have to go far. You know, when you think about Cain and Abel, nobody taught uh, Cain how to murder. That was within him, right? And then he had the audacity to try to cover it up <laughs> like, God, like God didn't see. And, you know, well, I'm not laughing at Cain. We all do that. You know, we try to cover it up. That's what Adam and Eve did. They tried to cover it up as if God does not see, right? But Paul is saying here that deep down, I'm in happy agreement with God's law. I know that it's good, but he's saying there's a, there's parts of myself, parts of my body, parts of my soul that doesn't agree with the spirit in me that know, knows that God's law is good for me. And then I highlight it. I have become a prisoner in this war to the rule of sin in my body. Now, remember, this is not the whole story. We're just looking at a snapshot. We're going to read chapter eight, nine, and 10. And so we're going to see how Paul comes out of this. So we don't want to build theology and doctrine on, you know, part of this letter. So let's continue. So the last two verses of this chapter. I am absolutely miserable. Oh my goodness. Is there anyone who can free me from this body where sin and death reign so supremely? I am, he answers it. I am thankful to God for the freedom that comes through our Lord Jesus, the anointed one. So on the one hand, I devotedly serve God's law with my mind, but on the other hand, with my flesh. I serve the principle of sin. My goodness. So it's like a cliffhanger. You know, I don't know if you, you're you old enough, but we would we would uh, watch that show. Uh, what was it? Dallas. And it was like, who killed JR? <laughs> so that's what this is. It's like a, a cliffhanger. You know, he answers it for us though. When he's saying, who will rescue me? He says, I'm thankful. The Lord Jesus Right. So we get to see the cliffhanger is not who will rescue us. The cliffhanger is how Paul comes out of this and that how we can see how we can come out of it. Because he's saying I devotedly. Now, here's a key right here. I serve God with the law of my mind. But we have this flesh that's always warring against that serving of God in our spirits or in our mind. So what do we do with that? So here's something that I want you to think about. It says um, in research, some people believe we're two-part beings or, um, and we believe, or I believe that we are tripartite beings. So we have, um, we live in a body. If you look at that first arrow to the right, we live in a body. We have a soul and, and we are truly, our true nature is our spirit. So our body is our flesh, our skin, you know, our hair. It's, it's the temple of God. It's what houses us. And then you have the soul, which is made up of that inner dark so circle, your mind, your will, and your emotions. And so in the mind, you have your thoughts, your meditations, your reflections, it's the place where decisions are made. You know, we made up in our mind to become children of the most high God, right? And so then in our, we are in our emotions. Now our emotions are just, you know, they, they you think of the word motion, they move us, 
they have a certain um dynamic to them you feel it you feel the flurries you're sad you're happy you're angry um you're upset those are our emotions and then we have the will and that's your intentions that's your motivator that's your chooser that's where your desires are birthed as well you know it's kind of like the mind and the will they can all of these work together that make up your soul um if you think back again to eve we were always in this of uh, the earth with a will because god did not force adam and eve to stay away from the tree of the knowledge of the good and of good and evil they had a choice so it was their job to submit their will under the will of the father but they didn't and that's why we're in this mess so you have again tripartite being you have your body your soul and your spirit your soul is made up of your mind your will and your emotions and then lastly we have what 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 we have is our spirit man and that's our new man that's the man who came to life in christ that's our new birth that's where we commune with god and so if you have an opportunity, flip over to 1 Corinthians 15, 45, and you'll see there, I'm paraphrasing, it's, it's, he talks about the first Adam was a living soul, but the last Adam, Jesus, is a quickening spirit. And in Genesis 2, 7, God said that man, I breathed in him the breath of life, and then man became a living being. So what happened through all of the foolishness, Jesus Christ, that quickening spirit man, perfect lamb of God, renewed or brought our spirit to life. And so the struggle that Paul is talking about is what you see on this diagram, because we have still a mind, emotions, and we have our will. That didn't go anywhere just because we were saved. We still have a body, you know, that didn't go anywhere because we were saved. That body still cries out. That body still wants to do what it wants to do. That body wants ice cream, pizza, and donuts, right? And the mind sometimes when it's not renewed, the mind is telling your body or telling my body, go get the ice cream, the pizza, and the donuts, <laughs> right? And then your will comes in, in between all of that. When the mind has the thought, the will is saying, okay, what am I going to do? Am I going to agree with this? Am I going to choose this? Am I going to desire this? And then all of this keeps playing out in our lives. And that's why Christ says that we have to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. That's why it's important that we're doing what we're doing and we're reading his word and we're getting his standards of living because we need to renew our mind. It's not even optional. If we want a successful, victorious life in Christ, we on this side of glory, we need to renew our minds and we don't do that. We can't do that by the, by with a two minute devotional. We can't do that with just a Sunday sermon. It is daily. It is daily that we have to eat. It is daily that we have to commune. And it's not just reading the Bible. It's taking our tripartite being and saying, God, I yield it with you. I need your influence on my spirit. So even if you could visualize this diagram, visualize that inner man, that spirit man becoming bigger, more powerful because of what Christ did on the cross. So now my spirit man is dictating to my mind. My spirit man is dictating to my will. My spirit man is dictating to my emotions. My spirit man, think of this look at this example remember when he said every thought take it captive against everything that exalts itself against god against the knowledge of god so no matter how saved we are there is that carnal mind that as soon as we read like paul said don't covet there's a will there's a flesh that's saying girl go ahead and covet sir go ahead and covet you know, don't commit adultery. There's a flesh and there's a will that's saying, go ahead and do it. Just like the serpent in the garden. You know, he had, he got Eve to say, well, now surely God didn't mean this and that. Surely, 
right? And so we have those same things. We have those same issues. We have those same concerns, but being a new creature in Christ, we now have a power. If you look at the diagram, there's no, there's no, um, intention of your will that will help you win the war. As Paul said, that comes against your carnal flesh and mind. We need God. There is no other way to say it. Remember what you were to remember from the beginning. Jesus Christ is King. The Holy spirit is power. We need the grace of God. We need the mercy of God and we need the strength of God, but we have to do our part and yield and do those disciplines that help us. The disciplines, you know, we're in COVID right now, so it's difficult, you know, to safely, we have to be prayerful about when we, where we go, when we go, but that doesn't excuse us from still maintaining a relationship with God. So with that said, we have just had an opportunity to hear from one of the greatest writers of all time, the apostle Paul, and that's not his words, but the inspired word of God written through him. So think about it this way. In Christ, we are free from the penalty of sin. That's the judgment and the power of sin, hopelessness. We're not hopeless. We have the power of, you know, the song, the power of sin is broken. Jesus overcame it all. Remember, remember that song. But while still in the flesh, we are not free from the presence of sin, the temptation and the possibility of sin are failures. So that's from Life Application New Testament Commentary. But again, remember, that's why Jesus said, you know, when you pray, when you look at the Lord's Prayer, it's lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Right? And so we are just walking in what God has already accomplished, the finished works of Christ. So think about this. Paul's also, uh, in Galatians five seventeen. this is a great way to think of this. The sinful nature, that sinful nature, think about it. That part that's not been redeemed fully, the mind, the emotions, your will, your body, your flesh, your desire, the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. So there's the conflict. There's the tension that Paul had, you have, I have. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. Now, remember, Paul is saying that at this time, but we have to read the whole word because we know that we are free to carry it out. We're just challenged and we need the whole help of the Holy Spirit. You know, they're constantly, those forces are constantly fighting us and they will always fight us until we go on to be with glory. Now, some things will become a little less, you know, if your temptation is key lime pie, well, day one, they say, matter of fact, 21 days, this change of habit, day one, you know, you ate, we ate t 10 slices. Day two, we ate nine. Then day five, we ate four. And then day two, we ate two. And then day one, we ate one. And so it's getting, it's that the impact, we're lessening, it's lessening the impact because of our discipline in Christ, hearing his voice, yielding to his, his uh, guidance in our lives. And so, the biggest thing that we can remember is this. And if you'll take a look at that, they're just hearts. Just, I think of it as like just pouring down from heaven, how much God loves us. And that because of his love for us and our love for him, we are constantly becoming and look at that ing becoming and attaining to become more like Christ. We'll never be him. That's why he died on the cross in our place for our atonement, for the penalty of sin.
But every day we ought to be seeking to become more and more like him. Never perfect, but realizing we, we are tripartite beings and that we do have struggles. We do have shortcomings. It's just the biggest thing is being honest with God and bringing those issues before him so that he can help us. So Selah, let's think about this. So Paul said he was miserable. Do you think that sin can cause someone to be miserable? Or do you think sin, sin is just great? Um, overall, do you desire to, if you were to take an honest question, you know, honest, have an honest discussion with yourself and God, do you desire to do the right thing and live a life of pleasing to the father? And, you know, just ask, we start, remember with honesty, what I said earlier, honey, the biggest sin we can tell ourselves is the one biggest sin is the one we tell ourselves. And then where does sin and death reign? You know, think back to that diagram. Where does the law in, of sin and death reign? And then who will or has set us free from the struggle between sin and the desire to do right? Paul answered that for us as well. So the fact is that all attempts to live in a life, live a life free from the control of sin, selfishness, and immoral desires will be ineffective and useless apart from faith in Christ and a personal relationship with him. That is, that is the only thing that will truly transform our lives, free us from Satan's power and provide us with the Holy Spirit's power for ultimate victory over sin. Now, one thing that we're all reminded, the Holy Spirit is reminding us, yes, we do. We have an enemy. He walks up around like a roaring lion. But what we don't want to do is blame Satan for the things that we are willing and able and lining up our chooser to take part in sin. That sometimes we are binding the enemy when we need to be binding our sinful nature. That's all he, he wants us to remember that. And that comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so let's take a spotlight on scriptures. We want to see, you know, it's not until we've read that whole where we can get a, a good uh, idea. So you can Google sin, you know, in your own time, Google sin, see what scriptures you come up and you find. So here are just three that I found. God chose us to be in a relationship with him even before he laid out plans for this world. He wanted us to live holy lives characterized by love, free from sin and blameless before him that's that good good father that's ephesians 1 4. don't you know that as long as you do what is right then i accept you but if you do not do what is right watch out because sin is crouching at the door ready to pounce on you you must master it before it masters you that's 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 god talking to cain and it's the same thing he you notice he didn't say the devil is crouching at the door, although we know he does crouch. But he's saying in Genesis 4, 7, the first book, sin, sin because of what we inherited from the first Adam. It's crouching at our door and we have to master. And here's the choice. It, there is no in between. We either master it or it masters us. Like I said, all we have to do is look at the news. Oh, we have to look. Oh, and actually, we don't have to look at the news. We can look. I can look at places in my own life that things have died or did not come to pass, because I allow sin, the seed of sin, to be sown in my life. And when it came up, the consequences choked out some things. So let's keep going. Because they despise the eternal's ritual offerings, the eternal one judged that sons that the sons of Eli had sinned greatly. Right. So you can read that in first Samuel too. You know, there were some, the son, the sons of Eli, they didn't have a great ending. So in, in Eli himself. So that's just looking at, you know, we, we see uh, two verses in the old Testament and one in the new Testament. So we're looking, why do we do that spotlight the scriptures? Cause we need to see God, you're a God, your mind, your mind, your tech, your strategies may change, but your character doesn't. So if it was true in Genesis, it's true now, not everything, 
you know, just you have to be able to, by the Holy Spirit, um, God will show you, okay, these things still apply today. We don't have to put blood on a lamb and all of that and put our hands on the scapegoat and send them out in the wilderness. We don't have to do those things. But there are some things that God, that are his universal standards. Okay, so we will um, continue on. So here's a reflection. After reading this chapter, do you have a different perspective regarding sin. I mean, I hope, I know I've learned, you know, and will continue learning because that's the point of his word. So that, if you know, one of my leaders would say, Hey, I come to provoke you to change, not you, but us, that his word will provoke us to change. And then, so here's your opportunity to write down, reflect, go back. You know, I would suggest you can even remember we're not in a rush. This is not a marathon to read Genesis through revelation. Now, um, if you read the one year Bible, I even read that at times. Um, but when we're meditating, we're trying to get the word of God engrafted. Remember that diagram, we need to engraft it in our mind and, and engraft it in our emotions and graft it in our will. Um, it takes meditation. So again, Joshua one and eight, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in a day and night. Why? That we may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then we will make our way prosperous and then we will have good success. So we give ourselves over to learning. We meditate. Um, if you're not a writer, I, I, I write. Sometimes I get in my moods. You know, I'm more of a digital writer probably than a uh, pen and paper. Um, but if you just need to just however you do, I mean, sit down and just explore the gifts God has given you. You'll find a lot of gifts. I mean, when you're reading the word, you might have a gift for drawing, writing, illustrating. Um, I know that there have been times in my life where I've taken a scripture and made a song out of it. You know, just enjoy your time, your personal reflection with God. So with that in mind, I have a reaction. Every time I read God's word, I, you know, hopefully we all have a reaction. So you can take your phone and you can scan this QR code and you can see what my reaction is after reading his word, learning what Paul is telling us in Romans chapter seven and how that has an impact on our lives. And so if you are listening to this and you are not saved, if you're listening to this and you are saved, this will just help you. Um, if God brings someone in your path and you can bring them into, uh, the kingdom of God. And it's based on Romans 10, nine through 13. And all it's saying is I'm paraphrasing that if we acknowledge and we confess with our mouth, the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're not saved, you just say right there, Lord, I acknowledge and I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. I recognize your majesty. I recognize your power. I believe God that you raised you, God, you raised him from the dead. And because of that, I am now saved. And I believe this God in my heart. That's all you have to say. I believe it in my heart. I confess with my mouth. I believe in my heart. My mind might come and try to tell me different, but God, as of this day, I believe with my heart. And so I'm acknowledging and I'm confessing. And because of that, God, I believe I believe that I'm saved. And so the rest of those scriptures are just saying, whoever, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So don't let anybody talk you out of your salvation. That's another reason why we read, because there's so many things going on. You know, you have atheists and agnostics and just all kind of stuff going on. And that we can fall into confusion if we just don't keep our mind stayed on Jesus Christ, stayed on his word stayed on his word, communing with the father. So with that, you know, this day that your salvation is made sure because of Romans 10, nine through 13, don't ever doubt it from this day forward. So, and the rest of us, all of us, we want to be continually made as house houses of prayer. So, um, as we learn, we learn not only for our own lives, but for the lives of those we're connected to. So who is the Holy Spirit bringing to your mind right now? I'm believing God that they are. And if, if you know of someone in your life, your immediate circle that are not saved, pray the prayer of salvation that, that God would draw them to himself. And then what, what word, if you have friends, family, um, that are saved, 
and you have a word that you can put on it, or in other words, a word that you can decree and declare for them. Maybe there's somebody, you know, even within our own family, there, if someone's sick and they're in need of healing, you know, that we stand in the gap and we, we speak over that person and, and declare his word. So with that said, I just pray that you have been blessed by this and that the word has been brought with clarity by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then pray back what you've learned. You know, it doesn't have to be a fancy prayer. Just pray back what you learn. Acknowledge and thank God for who he is. And so let's just pray uh, together. Heavenly Father, we just thank you today, God. We thank you that you do all things well, God. We bless you. We know that you are bigger than all of our circumstances. You're bigger than the struggles. You're bigger than our flesh, God. We thank you because we have been birthed into your kingdom, Father, that the struggles that we have internally, Father, and externally, that you, as we saw earlier, Jesus Christ is king. The Holy Spirit Spirit is power, and you are our Father, and that you love us with a faithful love, God. And that you seek to establish and continue a never ending, everlasting relationship with us, God. And because of your faithful love towards us, God, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ that we just keep on learning your word. Keep on learning. Keep on applying. Keep on learning. And we keep on applying, God, so that we continue to live a life that's pleasing to you. We know that the seal has been already set upon us through the blood of Jesus Christ. We know that we are already righteous. We know that we are already approved. But as we walk this out in real time, God, we just thank you that we don't allow sin to overpower us. But because of what Jesus Christ has done, he's living, his power is living on the inside of us to help us, God, that when those things come against us, God, that we can make a different choice. You said in your word, sin is crouching at your your door you we must master it and so we thank you for your power god we never lean on our on our own power on our own intelligence god on our own talents we lean on you you are the only one that has saved us and will keep on saving us so we bless you god we bless you god for who you are in our lives so May the Lord bless you, the eternal one bless and keep you in Christ's name. Amen. May he he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the eternal one lift up his countenance to look upon you and give you me peace. So I pray you've been blessed by this. Share this on your social media platforms. But most of all, I pray that you just, first we share it with ourselves. You know, we sit down and we just really kind of go over it and think it through. Sometimes it's good to just say, hey, for a week, I'm in this chapter. I'm not moving on. I'm in this chapter. So share what you've learned first with ourselves. And then, you know, if in your community, um, if you do family Bible time um, with friends, with a group now with COVID, you know, we got a lot of, we do a lot of meetings with Zoom, whatever you need to do. Um, Iron sharpens iron. We're like the Bereans. You just want to encourage each other. You know, we're a two-edged sword is what his word is referred to at times. And so we praise God. We lift up a hallelujah. We thank him for who he is. We give him all the honor. We give him all the glory. We shout in his name. We dance in his name. We celebrate in his name because we truly have been given the victory in God, even though it doesn't feel like it at times. We have been given the victory in Christ. And so if anybody in this world has a right to shout, has a right to dance, has a right to say, I'm I'm going to, like one of the songs, stomp. (laughs) We're going to stomp, we're going to dance, we're going to lift up our hands. And so I pray you have been blessed by this. I pray you have been blessed by this. Your soul is growing our soul our mind emotions and will are lining up to god's word so we just praise him for who he is 
And so we remember like HTOs, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. Proverbs 4, verse 7. So I thank you for watching. Be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen.